Good morning and welcome to Birmingham Tech Week, day number four. I can't believe we're on day number four. We've had so much going on during the week so far. So many amazing speakers. And, and today, again, we've got a phenomenal lineup in store. Um, and of course, now we have how to implement innovation effectively, such an important topic for us all. And before we start, I just want to say a big thank you to our supporting partners for this week. Of course, Tech Nation, the West Midlands Growth Company and Department for International Trade, not just for supporting this week, but for all the work they do across the region and across the entire UK to support Birmingham and the West Midlands to champion us across everything that they do. Um, and also internationally as well, encouraging inward investment and helping tech organizations export their products and services. And of course, the week wouldn't be possible without our wonderful sponsors. Um, and a big shout out to NatWest, who of course we're joined by this morning um, for being our lead and headline sponsor and for all the work they do across the region again, especially through their wonderful Entrepreneur Accelerator. And of course, a big thank you to Copper Culture Group, BJSS, Sidetrade and BMET for supporting us and all the work they do across the tech ecosystem as well. And of course, our great partners, um, a great cross sector of public and private organizations. Um, shout out today to GBS LEP, um, you know, fantastic organization doing so much work and supporting so many businesses, especially right now, you know, helping businesses pivot um, and supporting them with financial aid and business support. And I've got a real privilege to introduce you now to your host, Pam Shimar, who is the Entrepreneur Development Manager at NatWest Entrepreneur Accelerator. But of course, Pam is also a Birmingham Tech Week Director as well and one of our wonderful team. So great to have Pam join us today. And we've got a fantastic panelist, panel, panel, I should say, joining us. So we've got Rohit Tawa, who is the CEO of Fast Future, a fantastic organization looking ahead to what is on the horizon in tech and innovation. And Stephen Chown, who's the innovation manager at NatWest, and who's going to talk to us about how to implement innovation effectively. And then we've got a great lineup of people pitching today. So we've got Callie Bagri, who is the CEO of the data company, Hannah Williams, founder of Scribble, and Sabrana, who is the CEO and founder of Moopley. Welcome all. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Pam, who will kind of take you through the first part of this session. Over to you, Pam. Pam, you're on mute. Thank you, Yanis. Thank you so much. Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome to um, our session today with NatWest, Implementing Innovation Effectively. I would like to um, just basically introduce myself. I'm the Entrepreneur Development Manager, as, um, as Yanis said, proud director at Birmingham Tech Week and delighted to be here and um, supporting the session today. So um, what I want to do today was just go through um, um, introduce our wonderful speakers, which I'll do it shortly. Um, they are pretty phenomenal. Um, we have today um, Rohit Talwa, we have um, Steve Chown, and we have some wonderful pictures who I'll introduce individually as, as I come up to them. But firstly, I just want to start off by telling you a little bit about our um, Accelerator Programme. So I'm delighted to say that at the NatWest Entrepreneur Accelerator Programme, we help and accelerate and provide a lightning rod to entrepreneurs at all levels. So firstly, to start off with um, our Dream Bigger program, which starts off um, with our 16 to 18 roles, helping them to achieve their goals and just think a little bit bigger in terms of what they want to do in their future. Back of Business is our um, program which supports female entrepreneurs and provides them with that funding, but so do have a look at that. Our current um, accelerator program is our digital accelerator called the Business Builder, which provides you with workshops, support, um, community network, and a whole host of um, events that also helps you um, grow and scale your, your, um, your, your entrepreneur business and your, yourself, actually. So our accelerator program, at the moment, we have had to pivot um, and we are delivering that digitally. And actually, we've had to help more, we've actually had more entrepreneurs currently than we did um, pre-digital. Pre so 
providing events such as an audience with events, so some fantastic support there. Our next level um, entrepreneur program helps those entrepreneurs who are growing um, at multi-million pound level. So, um, and that's an invite only NatWest accelerator in terms of next level. We also have the FinTech program, which Steve Chan will tell us a little bit about today. So I'll let um, Steve explain a little bit about that. And we also have our climate accelerator program, which um, is a new program. We, and we're really passionate about supporting um, climate and sustainability and applications are open now. So if you're interested in that one, please do reach out. So on that note, I'd love to introduce our first speaker. So I'm really excited to have Rohit here today. So Rohit is a global futurist, an award-winning keynote speaker, CEO of Fast Future. Um, and he does intriguing work in helping with clients understanding and shape emerging future innovations and disruptions. So I'm delighted on that note to hand over to Rohit. Well, good morning all, uh, or good afternoon or good evening, wherever, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, my role, if I get this right, uh, in this session is really to help people think about how do we innovate in the environment that we're operating in now where there's incredible uncertainty around how the next few months, let alone few years could play out. And I really want to talk to you about that and how do we tap into that and take advantage of the opportunities that arise even in chaos? And I think the, the important thing to recognize is that right now, as organizations, we're having to think about three different time horizons. Firstly, what are we doing in the next three months to make sure we're viable, that we're resilient? And we, we basically got operational stability for whatever might come in, in the near term. And we're really making sure we're paying attention to the subtle shifts happening, which businesses are up, which are down, which sectors are we serving? What conversations are we having with customers in those sectors to understand how their buying behavior in particular might change in the next few months? Secondly, we also need to be thinking about the year ahead. Well, we know that pretty much every sector is gonna be changing how the game is played, changing the rules of the game, and making sure that we're doing the kind of market product and process innovation that we need to to stay relevant and to take advantage of those shifts taking place and finally something that we see the best companies doing whatever size they are is looking further ahead thinking about the next one to ten years what might be coming how might that lead to uh, the need for reinvention of our business even if we're only a fledgling business how might we need to reinvent with all the science, the technology, the new ideas coming through and really putting together two or three scenarios about how those things might come together over the next few years and exploring what the impact might be for our business. And that then allows us to go back and say, okay, what do we need to be doing in the next 12 months to make sure we've got sufficiently open mindsets, that we're learning, developing the skills we need to enable us to respond, respond and adapt to whatever might come next. And what we know is that there are a massive set of forces at play that are really shaping the environment. We can't deal with all of them. We can't deal with all the possible individual outcomes as individual topics. But what we can do is look at how they might come together into scenarios. And when we look at scenarios, we're looking at the next two or three years and saying, how might the pandemic come out, uh, play out and what might happen to the economy? because these for us are the two most important uh, factors, but they're also the most uncertain. And that gives us four scenarios. So let me talk you through those scenarios. The important thing here to remember is not to pick the scenario that you like best or that you most think is gonna happen, but actually to give yourself permission to think about what you do in any one of these scenarios. And maybe as we transition from one scenario to the next, and make sure you're coming up with ideas for what you might do, because some of the ideas that come up in the worst case scenario actually turn out to be the best enablers of future business. So the first scenario we call uncharted territory, and this is where we have a very poorly contained pandemic and a deep economic downturn. So this is where maybe the, vi the vaccine doesn't work next year or only works late, it only impacts less than 50% of people and we don't get full vaccination across the planet for two or three years, and it takes us a long time to truly pull out of the pandemic. That has a, a massive impact on businesses, on individuals, people losing their jobs, businesses closing down, but also means that we will see 
in industry sectors thrive. So we know cardboard box manufacturers have thrived in, in the current situation because of the massive rise in e-commerce sales. And there'll be many, many sectors that do thrive. But overall, we can see that in some countries, what, uh, we're going to see a very deep downturn. Others, we might well see them, them turn the corner quite quickly. So already, we can see countries like Vietnam, Taiwan, New Zealand, turning the corner and their economies on the bounce back because they've had relatively low infection rates, they've had it under control, and they can move forward with some confidence. The second scenario is one where the, the vaccine does work, but it takes a long time still. It takes a couple of years to get it implemented and to get everyone to a stable level of health. What that means is that we will have a, you know, we could have a, a still quite a deep downturn, but when we come out of it, countries are more robust, industries are more robust. So there's more confidence about what the recovery might look like and a stronger focus on bouncing back in a healthy way. The next scenario we call Rocky Road, and this is one where many people think we are now, where even though we're, we're not recovering from the pandemic and we might not again recover for two to three, maybe four years, and the vaccine may not be so effective, and certainly the first round might not be so effective, maybe the second or third round is more powerful, impacts more people. But in this scenario, governments are really putting that focus on trying to get the economy going, selected investments into key sectors, but also providing the business support and the support to individuals to try and get the economy moving and really putting a focus on isolating those people who are at risk, locking down areas selectively as they peak, and then letting them out again. So, so a very hesitant recovery in this one, taking maybe two to three years to see full economic recovery for somewhere like the UK. And the final scenario we call hope and renewal. This is the one where we get lucky on the vaccine. It impacts more than 50% of people on the first round in the middle of next year. We get most of uh, the, the at-risk people in the UK vaccinated by the end of the year and everyone vaccinated by uh, 2022. And government really taking the lead in many countries on driving the renewal. So putting investment into startups, putting investment into the green tech sector, encouraging businesses to invest and create jobs, and putting a big focus on retraining so that we have a healthy, vibrant and sustainable bounce back. So those are the four scenarios. The one that's most interesting to me is actually that worst case scenario, a poorly contained pandemic and a deep downturn, because that's where we need to be putting our focus to say, well, what ideas would we create? And what this really means is we can't just get through with ordinary models of leadership. We need to recognize that there's a real lack of clarity about what the external environment could look like and a real lack of clarity and, and agreement on exactly what the right strategies are, which calls for us to become extraordinary leaders in terms of the way we think about the future, the way we talk to our customers and really engage at a deep level with them and their needs. And most importantly, how we're looking at our people, developing their talents, developing their skills and helping them open their minds to a range of possibilities, whether we're a six week old startup or a mature company that's been around for 100 years or more, that's true. So what are some of those key uncertainties or certainties that we then have to tap into in order to take advantage? Well, the first is what this lockdown showed us and what this pandemic showed us was many people weren't prepared uh, and we didn't necessarily have the right skills to do as well as we might have done in this last few months. So really now we have to focus on how do we become more prepared for a range of shocks, a range of opportunities, and what are we doing to make sure that people are learning fast so we have the capacity to adapt to whatever might come next. We also need to be thinking about things like uh, the sustainable development goals, inclusivity, mental health. These are all becoming big challenges for us. And to make sure that even if we're a, uh, an early stage company, when we're building our strategy, we're thinking about where on these UN sustainable development goals are we going to make an impact? And I'll give you an example a little later in the talk. We also know that there is a phenomenal uh, pace of acceleration now in a range of fields of science and technology that are moving at an, an exponential pace or faster. And this becomes really critical because these 
are creating the next wave of trillion dollar industry. So if you're looking at where to play, where next to innovate, well, this gives you a, an interesting scope. And this taps into a couple of things that I think are really important. The first is that the technologies now allow us to create very small footprint solutions. We can pioneer new auto manufacture with factories producing 3D printed cars with just two and a half thousand cars. So the scale has changed. As I say, the rules of the game are changing. But also we know that the pandemic has accelerated a trend that was already there. The OECD tells us that from 2013 to 2019, uh, Supply chains on average for companies were shortening by 50 kilometers a year. People were bringing supply chains closer and closer to home and forming new relationships to deliver goods to other markets or get them manufactured there. The pandemic accelerated that. A lot of countries are now saying, how do we bring manufacturing closer to home? How do we encourage local manufacturers and local entrepreneurs to start up new ventures in these sectors? And how do we create those small footprint factories to deliver on that? So there's an incredible opportunity here, wherever you sit in the value chain, to either help that happen, to license your own products to country, companies in other countries and do joint ventures with them, or to see how you can help countries and companies take advantage of these technologies to set up the new solutions and the new entrepreneurial models to bring them to market. We also know that we're, we're deep in digital territory now. The five biggest companies in the world are tech companies. They've actually all done phenomenally well in this last several months uh, as we really embed ourselves in tech. And, and to see that impact played out in the markets is quite incredible. Last year, Apple, Amazon, and Microsoft all crossed the trillion dollar valuation threshold. Now, Apple this year have gone over $2 trillion a few times. To put that in context, if you added all these companies together, like Bank of America, Ford, Hilton, Volkswagen, plus all these others, you still wouldn't get one Amazon. And what that tells us is that technology is really penetrating deep into the heart of everything. So whatever type of venture we are, are we mastering technology? Do we really understand what the tech's possible capable of? Do we understand the needs of the marketplace for us to drive that technology in? And do we have the digital understanding and digital literacy to really be able to take advantage of this, not make expensive mistakes and help our customers take full benefit from the technologies we're delivering or the technologies they're implementing? We also know that the big tech players are all very keen to build these cloud ecosystems. Uh, we saw this with Facebook Libra, this idea of locking in a huge volume of customers into a closed system. Facebook has something like 2.7 billion customers across all its platform. The idea was that you would do commerce within there, you would make your payments within there, you wouldn't need banks, you wouldn't need credit cards, people would supply each other within the network and you would earn rewards, advertising rewards that could be converted into tokens that could be used for payment. You could provide services for crypto payments and all of this would happen within this ecosystem now it's taken a little step back because a few of the big players that thought this wasn't good for them but we are going to see all of the tech players basically getting in there and creating these kind of ecosystems so the question for all of us is where do i want to play in those ecosystems how do i make sure i'm lined up to be in there as a key partner in those early on to take advantage of what's coming and we're seeing artificial intelligence possibly as the, the most important of all technologies really been accelerated during the downturn investment, taking us from a basic level one of expert systems and robotic process automation, which we've seen a real growth in, through to what's called artificial general intelligence, maybe level five in the spectrum, where we have technology that's as smart as us. Uh, through to the singularity at level seven, where we have artificial super intelligence connecting our ideas, our dreams, our behaviors. Now that might be 20 to 30 years off, but within five years, I think we're going to have AI that's as smart as 80% of us, 80% of the time. If you're not involved in AI right now, I think that the primary uh, pr priority for every leadership team, and there's a great learning tool called the elements of AI, provided by the University of Helsinki, where you can go in and in six modules, it teaches you the fundamentals of AI. And that puts you in a much better position
to have great conversations with colleagues, with suppliers, with customers about AI, where it's going and how it could be used in your business or in your customer's business. We're also seeing that whilst the pandemic has led to massive disruption, this will only continue. Technologies like AI are gonna disrupt workplaces. We are gonna see jobs being lost. We're gonna see new industries emerge and new jobs being created. And we're gonna see new platforms, whether it's uh, the kind of thing we've seen during the lockdown when 9 million people in the UK got guaranteed basic incomes, <clears throat> we could well see those become more of a, a normal feature in many countries where people are getting guaranteed services, guaranteed incomes, which again creates a huge opportunity to provide those services and solutions to the marketplace. So we, we've gone through fairly fast the scenarios and some of the shifts that create opportunities. Now, what are the tactics we can take to unlock opportunities? Well, I think one of the first things is, is however optimistic you are to make sure you're talking to the people who had failures. Over 90% in every sector of the businesses that are launched fail, even higher in tech. So making sure that you understand what were the causes of death for those businesses that failed. And quite often we'll find that it's not that they didn't have good technology, it's all around leadership, it's all around who they wrapped around that business in terms of advisors and non-exec director directors and not thinking through the marketplace and how it might have issues adapting to the technology or the solution we're offering. So really making sure we're understanding why others have failed so we can learn from them and, and learn to, to adapt faster. The second is to make sure we're doing that scanning of the horizon, what's coming next, building some scenarios and creating our own roadmap so that we can uh, build our own ecosystem around that to help us with that scanning, customers, suppliers, partners, making sure that we have people feeding us ideas on a continuous basis. The next that I think is really important, I talked about the sustainable development goals. Uh, one of the critical things now is to make sure that our business is making a difference beyond just providing a good product or service and making money. We need to think about what is that bigger difference we're making. And, and in the entrepreneurial space, we're seeing an incredible array of businesses who are doing that. And as a result, putting themselves on the radar of big brands. The one you see on the screen is a company that makes handbags. They're called Elvis and Cressa founded by two venture capitalists. They spent three weeks at rubbish tips looking at what people were throwing away to say, well, how could we recycle that? They discovered that the UK fire service throws away over 70 tonnes of fire hose that's irreparable every year and pays over 400 ton, pounds per tonne to dispose of it. They investigated and discovered that high-end handbags were often made of the same material. So they struck a contract with the fire service, which lasts for 20 years, where they're taking that material from them for free, saving the fire service 400 pounds plus per tonne, but then they're turning them into handbags and then they're giving 50% of their profits back to the fire service. So this is a win-win all round. And it's led to very big brands coming to them and saying, look, we have these leather off cuts. We have you know, all sorts of materials that we're wasting. Can we partner to recycle that and create new products? And they're doing phenomenally well. They get a new approach every few months for someone wanting to buy them. They're steadfastly refusing to do that because they've delivered organic growth and the big band partnerships are really acting as that exponential accelerator for us. So doing good can also be a really powerful way of raising brand profile and generating new opportunities. The next is to make sure we're always thinking the unthinkable now. Uh, and we can do that through what we call weekly workouts, where we basically take an issue every week and with the team, we work through well, how might respond to it. So we take the idea of, you know, what if that suddenly someone came to market and brought uh, new products to market that were half the price of ours, just rather than arguing about whether it happens or not, or might happen or not, just working through what we would do and how we would respond. And similarly, getting really good at doing very fast experimentation and knowing how to kill an experiment that doesn't seem to be working and how to bring customers in very quickly to see whether there's any money in the idea we're generating. It might be a brilliant idea, but if there's no market there, are we the ones who want to pioneer it? The fifth is to make sure that we're really lazy, raising the literacy of our people. 
giving them more and more personal responsibility to drive their own learning and share their ideas with each other. Critically here, we find that one of the best ways of doing this is having people spend 10 minutes a day just watching videos on the web. We know that platforms like Futurism, World Economic Forum, Cheddar, Interesting Engineering, et cetera, et cetera, have these great videos of one to five minutes about new ideas, new industries, how we're solving old problems with new technologies, and about the kind of science and technology innovations that are happening. And to just be absorbing that really accelerates our learning and really helps us get new ideas into the organization faster. And we need two types of skills here. We need what you see on the left-hand side, which are the skills that help us develop the personal mastery, to stay calm under pressure and to navigate what's going on. And the skills on the right-hand side of the screen are the ones which really help us make sure that we can respond to whatever's happening, to by doing the horizon scanning, doing the scenario planning, doing the big picture thinking, having a range of problem solving approaches. They're the ones that really help us respond faster in any situation, but they also give people the tools to be effective whatever job they move into, whether inside the organization or outside. And we know that there are some great new models for getting educated. On the right-hand side of the screen, you see that places like Harvard and many others are now offering free courses in almost everything. You only pay for the certification. So there's not an issue now about access. And if we want to go deeper, uh, this is a great example of a new type of business school, JOLT. Uh, they offer what's called a NAMBA and not an MBA. And basically what that is, is a program where the students come into class at the moment, they're doing it from home, but the faculty come in by video. So if you really want to understand about what's going on in investment banking, you have someone from Bank of America take an hour out of their day to, to beam in and give us a lecture about what's going on on the front line, or someone from Google talking about the latest analytical products. And they're much more willing to do that for an hour at their desk than they are to give up half a day to come in and visit you and then leave again, et cetera. So we're seeing new models. And the great thing about uh, the NAMBA is it's about 1 18th of the price of an MBA from London Business School and about 1 6th of the price of the average business school MBA. So we're really seeing some great new models to accelerate learning. And then finally, we know that business is being reimagined. Every sector is being reimagined. The question I would ask you as, as entrepreneurs is, what are you doing to reimagine your own business for the future? Even if you've just started, what could the next version of it look like? And also, what role can we play in help, helping other industries reimagine their own business? Uh, and when I say reimagining, it's really thinking through absolutely everything we do. So there's a great company in Italy that is, is my favorite at the moment. They're called EarthBuy, and they're creating 100% biodegradable plastic. They're partnering with the academic world on everything they do from materials development through to manufacturing to get the very best ideas into their process. They're using blockchain to monitor every step of the process so they have complete visibility of what's going on at every stage. And finally, they're using very new forms of green crypto tokens to finance their business and raise the money to take themselves forward. And we're seeing more and more of this where people are coming up with radically new ideas for everything they do as a business or bringing those into mature businesses. And the question for us is, what are we doing to make sure that we're part of that process again? So I hope this has made sense. It's been a fairly rapid canter through the scenarios some of the big shifts taking place that create opportunities for us, and then six ways that we can take advantage of this or prepare ourselves to take advantage of it. And the key here is that we all have some dance routines. We know how to respond if there's a downturn, if there's a big peak in customer demand, or suddenly a new competitor comes to market. But now we're seeing a perfect storm where everything is happening together. And some of those old dance routines don't work quite so well. So now we have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable with learning new ways of doing things, looking a little awkward as we get on the dance floor, but learning how to, to master the winning routine so that we can be successful in a fast changing world. Uh, and finally, just agreed with Nat West, that as a way of helping you all capture some of these ideas I'm talking about and those that are coming next and example videos, we have a newsletter. Uh, it's normally $149, but if you take a picture of what's on the screen and use that coupon code at checkout, you can have the newsletter for free for the next year.
So I hope that's been valuable and I wish you all the most incredible success in the year ahead and the years ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, just wanted to share my slides again. So Yanis, um, any, I mean, I mean, to be honest, got so much from that. I love the um, the analogy that, you know, we've, we've almost got to make sure we're one step ahead and, you know, AI is the tool. Um, and, and quite rightly, you know, how do you plan for a future that you just don't know? So Yanis, I saw some interesting questions come through. Do, do, do you want to ask a couple of questions to your, to Robert? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, Robert, um, incredible presentation um you know i think it's kind of filled us all with a lot of um a lot of food for thought um this morning um and, and a lot of ideas um so and, and thank you for that that very kind offer as well i know people across kind of the natwest entrepreneur accelerator and also birmingham tech will, will appreciate that ability to continue to learn from you for the next 12 months um one one question we've got coming in is 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 it a case for micro learning um, how does that compare with the way young people are learning at university? I think the two go in parallel. So micro learning is a great way of just picking up something very quickly. Uh, and we're using Zoom now. And Zoom, I think, is one of the best examples of micro learning. That any task you want to do, you can drop into their learning suite and watch a video about it or get a very quick tutorial on it. Five, 10, 15 minutes, we're picking up the skill we need. But the Universities, I still think, have and higher education still has a very valuable role in teaching people how to think in systematic learning approaches in going deeper into subjects. So micro learning is great, particularly for task related skills. But I think that broader education is critical. If we want to be leaders in synthetic biology, in advanced transport, in nanomaterials, in AI, you can't do all of that in, in short five minute segments. You need to go deep. You need to have time to really absorb the material and think about how to apply it. So I think but there's a role for both in society. And I think if we look five years ahead, the majority of jobs in this country will be graduate level jobs because we'll need that level of education to do them. A lot of the, the, the tasks that don't require that kind of education will be automated or will have redesigned those jobs to enable them to be automated. Indeed, indeed. And, and a question from Fred here. Um, what happens to patents and intellectual property? Great question. Uh, I think that whole world will need to be reinvented. There's lots of ideas at the moment, again, with things like micro patents, with people being able to pull patent ideas that are in a similar space and then effectively share the rewards. Uh, IP, I think we're going to see a big shift towards companies moving away from putting a manufacturing footprint or a supply chain footprint across the planet to more licensing their IP to local players so they can manufacture locally. And there'll be in all sorts of arguments and debates and lawyers will make a lot of money in terms of coming up with the right kind of IP solutions. But I think we're in a really interesting world where all of that is up for grabs in the next few years. Absolutely. And um, what, one question here as, as well is, um, if you were a young man, again, I'm sure we're not suggesting you're, you're old, Rohit. Um, um, I am. <laughs> Don't you let these youthful looks deceive you. <laughs> uh, what, what would you kind of um, back yourself on? What, what would you kind of, how, what, what area would you focus on? Uh, I think learning, the whole learning space is, is a huge one. I think that um, we're only at the very earliest stages of robotic process automation, task automation, finding intelligent ways of helping people automate their own tasks, I think will be really important. And then anything that's around the provenance and traceability of products, we're becoming, we're becoming more and more concerned about where does a product come from? How is it man manufactured? what's its environmental footprint. So anything that can help do that and can make it easier. So I can scan a, an item on the shelf of a, a store and know that whole story. And my phone just tell me that it fits my criteria or it sits outside my ethical and sustainability criteria. And even to be able to do that to the food on a, a restaurant menu, to be able to scan it and understand where it was sourced. And again, all those things. And they're therefore telling me which of the items on the menu, again, fit my criteria. That whole space, I think, is going to be really important. 
those tied to health apps. So again, only showing me the items on the menu that uh, fit me physiologically that are good for my dietary regime. All of that creates a phenomenal range of, of information provision opportunities. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And then um, one, one question here from Matt, if we've got time for one more. Um, is there a real risk that innovation will outstrip user capability and business uptake? Um, this should be a clear opportunity to provide tools and support to help bridge the gap quickly and effectively. Uh, people have been asking that question since about the 1950s. Uh, innovation has always outstripped humans' willingness to understand the changes and to look at how they might adopt them. Right now, people are, are in crisis, they're in shock mode still. And so some companies are taking that as an opportunity to accelerate their innovation process. Others are battening down the hatches. But I think that the key here is around digital literacy and really making sure we're not explaining our innovation and trying to sell our innovation, but showing the depth of our understanding of the challenge a client faces or the opportunity that they might be able to realize and then showing them how our offering can help them and how our innovation differs from what they do today and what they will need to do inside their organization to take advantage of it. And those are simple things. They sound simple, but they're often the reason businesses fail. I talk to a lot of big organizations and, and they look at a lot of new ventures and, and, and new technologies and new innovations. And most of the time, they, the, the innovation doesn't get rejected because it's not good. It's because they don't know how to bring it into their organization and manage the objections internally or adapt their internal processes to get the benefits from what that innovation offers. Indeed, yeah. And, and it's interesting because I, I sit as part of the digital skills partnership across the West Midlands. And, you know, we're very well aware of, of the kind of digital skills gap that is there and, and, and it's kind of, you know, kind of growing in, in some areas and some areas it's, it's, it's shrinking. But um, yeah, I think it's a concerted effort across kind of public and, and private sector to make sure that we kind of narrow that digital skills gap to provide the, the right skills into, into businesses so they can succeed. Um, and I think kind of, again, kind of, I know NatWest do a lot around kind of financial literacy as well, which I think goes hand in hand mm. with that kind of digital skills piece. Um, so Rohit, yeah, once again, thank you for, for doing that. Um, lots of, of kind of insight and, and inspiration. <laughs> Rohit, thank you, Janice. Thank you. Great questions, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, Rohit, amazing slides. <laughs> what can I say? Really kind of um, intriguing slides, really do paint the picture. So I hope so far um, from your, Rohit, you've seen kind of how innovation increases our chances to react to change um, and also to discover new opportunities and also kind of um, make sure you, you can see how much digital literacy in just in the past you know, few months has, has changed. So what I'd like to do now is um, introduce um, some of our uh, entrepreneurs. Um, th these, the entrepreneurs who are going to pitch now are particularly disruptive in, in, in the businesses that they're doing, and they'll showcase so, some of their innovation. So I'm going to firstly hand over to Kali Bargari. Um, I'm not going to take away too much of his pitch, so all I'm going to say is, over to you, Kali, um, from the data company. Pam, thanks very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. So, just the pitch. Do you all know that we're in the fourth industrial revolution? Data is a new oil for the global economy and is key to innovation. Problem businesses have is that their data is locked away in spreadsheets, databases, systems, and they struggle to get the data they need to make informed business decisions. So I'm Kelly Bargary, CEO of The Data Company. We've developed a software platform that allows you to collect, correlate, and enrich data so that you can get a single source of truth. Using that data, we've helped a construction company save £300,000 in two months by connecting their HR and payroll data. We've saved an insurance company, uh, identify a million pounds of fraud within a six month period. And we've helped a pharmaceutical company say 500 pounds, 500,000 pounds in three months by negotiating better supply chain deals. With data being the new oil, there's a huge market opportunity for businesses like ours who can help companies use data to make better business decisions. We've got a very experienced team. I've sold over $100 million of software in the last five years. 
And my ask from you is to introduce me to directors of businesses who want to use data and have a turnover of more than five million pounds to help unlock the value of their data. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kali. So, Yanis, there will be an opportunity to ask the pitchers questions about their business. Um, so, if you do have any questions, please do pop them in the chat. Um, so, I'm going to hand over to um, Hannah. Um, again, um, disruption in a different way, innovative in a different way. So, over to you, Hannah. Thank you so much, Pam, and it's lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. So, if you think a picture is worth a thousand words, try 60,000 words. We understand information 60,000 times faster as a visual compared to words alone. With organisations now working remotely, engaging staff is more difficult than ever, which can often lead to unclear goals and discouragement. What I'm hearing from my customers is to quickly understand information and get teams to realise their purpose, we must work differently. I'm Hannah Williams, an illustrator of complex information, and I help marketing, HR and comms teams to engage and inspire their people. By using a form of powerful visual storytelling, I draw information and breathe life into your communication. After working with over 40 organizations internationally, customers have described how my business, Scribble Inc, helps transform ideas and events into engaging visual pieces. So no more boring PowerPoint slides or pages of dull text. If you're looking for a new effective way to share your story, I ask that you get in contact and we can discuss how visual summaries will level up your engagement strategy. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Hannah. So and I agree, you know, learning styles are different. So why are we sticking to the one, you know? So thank you so much. Really? Okay. I'm gonna hand over to um, Saab Rana, um, CEO, founder of Moopli. Um, again, a very innovative um, business. So over to you. Thank you, Pam, and good morning, everyone. Did you know that only 15% of applications for finance are successful when buying property at short notice? And the two main reasons behind this is an application not meeting a lender's criteria and there being unnecessary delays throughout the manual processes that are involved. My name's Saab and I'm from Moopli. Moopli is an online marketplace that uses the power of AI and big data to exactly match applications direct to lender. And in doing so, we increase the success rate from the 15% to 80%. And integrating all of those manual processes, we're able to offer speedier completion times. And by leveraging big data, we not only help our clients, but our lenders make better informed decisions. And my ask for those of you on this call is, if you have property professionals or investors within your personal or professional circles, then please make the introduction to Moopli. I'm sure we can add value to them. Thank you. Back to you, Pam. Thank you so much, Saab. So um, every, thank you, all three of you. So all of, all of these entrepreneurs who are on our phenomenal NetWest Accelerator program um, have um, sub submitted what we call innovations. So NatWest being a, a, a financial institution, we constantly want to innovate. And one of the things we do do is we, we, we work with innovative businesses to see how we can grow, grow and scale. So if you are interested in, in, in speaking to NatWest, you know, do reach out with your innovations. Um, so thank you so much, guys. Yanis, we've probably got time for one question. Is, is there anything key that's pick up with all of them? Um, there was one question for, for Callie that came in. Um, mm -hmm. and that was, how do you get around data protection laws, both locally and internationally? So we, we conform to GDPR in the UK, probably in South Africa, because the data resides on the client site. So we're accessing data in their cloud environments or their IT infrastructure, and they're using that data then to make the decisions they want. Great, thanks. And and just, yeah, kind of um, great great pitches from, from all of you. Um, and again, because someone that actually started off, I started off on the NatWest Accelerator a couple of years ago um, and then went to, to become a mentor as well. Um, yeah, if, if there are any entrepreneurs out there that are not already aware of it or involved in it, then I would highly recommend getting involved because it gives you so much access to, you know, opportunities, but also kind of the, the community feel actually of being alongside other entrepreneurs, I think is probably the biggest thing. So yeah, great work that, that kind of Pam and her team do. So thanks, Pam. Thank you, Yanis. Thank you. Thank you all of you um, for your pitches. Um, very brave. And um, we do try and test you guys a lot, don't we? So well done. And if anybody would like to get in touch, um, if, if you want to pop your details in the chat, um, Hannah, Saab and Kali, and that'd be wonderful. 
Thank you so much. So now I'm going to hand over to um, Steve Chown. So Steve um, has 25 years um, banking experience, so phenomenally um, um, experienced. Um, he leads the innovation for NatWest Accelerator Hub for our 12 hubs. He also leads the bank's FinTech Accelerator program. He's responsible for our global affiliate scheme and building links with international accelerators. Um, so without further ado, I'd love to hand over to Steve Chan. Welcome. Thanks, Pam, and thanks for having me, Yanis, on Berlin Tech Week. I'm really pleased to be here. So um, just going to take you a whistle-stop tour through um, innovation at NatWest. And I'll be very brief, so please ask any questions afterwards. So Pam, if you can jump onto the next slide for me. Great. So this is just an overview of the innovation ingredients. And on the left-hand side, you've got the Innovation Forum, Innovation Fund, um, Tech Advisory Board and Techno Technology and Innovation Committee. This is very high level. This is basically something the Innovation Forum sits on a sort of monthly basis. And that's actually got Alison Rose, who is our CEO on it. And these are the guys that actually look at what are the major innovation projects going on. So the first thing to say about NatWest is that innovation has been, been obviously part of what we've done over the years. But in the last few years, it's really taken up a lot of speed. And that's been from the top down. So this started with Ross McEwen a few years ago, who was our CEO and has carried on with Alison. And Alison sits on that innovation forum. And these are the guys that manage and control the budgets and the innovation funds for the big innovation projects that go through the bank. So this is an innovation um, from the top down. And I think that's a really important thing to start off with and talk about. This is not a small pocket of staff in NatWest trying to innovate, because that's always a really difficult thing to do. If you're just a small innovation team of say 10 people in an organization of 68,000, you're in a losing battle already to sort of innovate. Innovation in that West is from the top down. This innovation forum, um, these are the ones with the innovation fund almost has unlimited budgets to innovate uh, and launch new products. So on the um, right hand side, this is more the sort of field operatives, if you like, rather than the sort of people in the background with the, with the budgets. Um, we've got research teams um, and scouting teams. So research and scouting, um, Pam mentioned that we sort of worked with international affiliates uh, and we've done work in Israel um, and South Korea. We actually have research teams out in um, Silicon Valley, so we've got a small team in San Francisco. Um, we have teams who work out in Tel Aviv and Israel and the rest of the world, and obviously the UK and Europe as, as well. And they're looking at some of the hotspots of innovation around Europe, obviously London, but also places like Lisbon, Frankfurt, those sort of places. Um, obviously that did involve, back in the day, traveling around and visiting some of these places, not at the moment. Um, so our team, the entrepreneurship team, have been out to Israel a few times and actually recruited some Israeli entrepreneurs to come and join our program. And we've done the same in, in South Korea, which is really interesting. The OX and engineering are more the, the doers, I guess. So the OX is our innovation lab and they come up with new solutions. Um, there's, there's two of those, there's one up in Edinburgh um, and OX stands for open experience. This welcomes innovators into the bank to help us build new products. And this is particularly FinTechs, but also other technology companies as well. The engineering, uh, th these are the guys that build stuff. So these are the guys that create the new products and, and bring them to life for our customers. That's a brief overview there. So jump on the next slide for me, Pam. Brilliant. So what are we looking for? So when we're looking for new innovations, we always look for three, three particular things to start with. So can they firstly improve customer experience? That's number one on our list. So it's not to make money, that's actually last on the list, it's actually improve customer experience. We're always looking for things that will make um, our customers' lives easier when banking with us. Can it also save us money um, or can it increase, increase our income? That's the last on the agenda. I think one example I always sort of mention on this is the sort of video onboarding. Um, this took us quite a while to get um, implemented within the bank, but in the last year we've managed to get that implemented through Metal, our digital um, SME bank and through our, now through our sort of personal banking side as well. And that ticks all those boxes. So it massively improves customer experience. It makes it so much easier to open an account when you can take a video of yourself, take a photo of your driving license um, to get an account open. And obviously the FinTechs like Monzo, Revolut, those are the people that, people that really started that off. Um, and we've now joined that process as well. It saves us money. The reason it saves us money is that it makes the process a lot smoother. Um, it takes time out of the process um, and just bring, brings it um, much, much quicker overall. And it does increase income because it actually means more people end up opening accounts. The dropout rate for people opening accounts is huge because they get frustrated with the process. 
they don't send the documents in that are needed or the document gets lost at the post or that same things like that and people just disappear at that process to have a really slick onboarding process actually means more people actually end up opening accounts with us as well so when we um pam mentioned we look for innovations and we do that in two ways as pam said i run the fintech um accelerated program for the bank and we've got about 90 fintechs in the program at the moment so obviously we look at those we also look at other innovations that come through the bank because we're obviously a huge organization we've got lots of property people working for us learning all that sort of stuff so we also look at things like sustainability solutions learning solutions and what we try and do is put them in first of all in this i guess this um grid chart if you could just go forward a couple pam there we go. And um, what you need to look at when you're considering your innovation, how useful it might be to a bank or any other organization, is where it sits in this, is this zone. Um, <clears throat> and what you really want to do is you want to be in that, that sweet spot. So going back to the video onboarding, that is highly innovative for the bank, but also it's a high business priority. Our onboarding process was a high business priority to get better. What you don't really want to be is in this dead zone. So something that's not hugely innovative, but also not very high on the bank's business priorities. So what you really want to do if you're talking to any innovation um, professional in a bank or other organization is find out really where your innovation, if they really like it, that's great. Do they think it's really cool? Yes, they do. But find out where it is as a business priority for them. You want to find out, is this something that's going to sit up in its opportunities and shiny things where they want to have a play with it? They, they think it's really cool and it's really edgy. Um, but are they actually going to implement it? So is it moving on that business priority? So that's where you really want to think about it. Um, if it's low innovation, um, but it is a business priority, then you might be in that in incremental. So it's a small change to the process. Um, it's not really that disruptive, but it is improving the process slightly. So look to be in the sweet spot. If you're in the dead zone, I guess recognize it and move on to the next opportunity. Um, I think one thing you'll find, I've always said, certainly when we're um, talking to international um, as well is as banks and as British people we are generally pretty polite or most of us are so um, the bank will always be very hesitant to just say no um, and they'll often make quite encouraging noises as will other organizations because we, we like to encourage people that can give people the wrong impression that you are making steps or, or going along the, the route of being adopted by that the bank or anyone else we'd much rather be honest with you and I'm always honest with people and say look this isn't one for us um, you need to move on uh, because otherwise you can just invest so much time trying to tweak your proposition, take the feedback on board, move move on again um, and put all your eggs in one basket. So do recognise um, whether one, you are a business priority and also whether the person you're speaking to has actually got the authority to take your proposition forward as well. So find out where they sit, whether they're going to move on to the next level to get it authorised and move forward. So um, just don't have too many of those um, shiny things chats where they're just loving your loving your technology but not doing much else. so if you could jump on the next slide for me Pam. so over the last few years we've really worked on um bringing some new innovations to, to life within the bank and that's through that, that forum and, and the process i mentioned earlier and some of those i'll just briefly run through so Bo um, was our personal banking and uh, digital bank metal um, is our sme digital bank MIMO was an open banking solution that helps um, customers manage their household finances. TIL is our new merchant services. ESME Loans, I'll talk about in a minute, but that's some um, online loans business. Cora is our digital AI. Uh, currency Pay, uh, FX Solutions, that's sort of competitive for Revolut, those sort of people. And quantum Computing is something completely out there. The bank owns shares in a quantum computing company. And that's not because we want to be the next IBM. Um, but that's because we want to understand what's going on in that field and how it can affect banking. So we, we want to see that board to understand what's going on. So randomly, the bank has own shares in the quantum computing company. Um, if you're going to launch innovative solutions into the marketplace, you are going to see ones that um, don't succeed. And you'll see there's a couple of big red crosses on that screen. Um, and those ones are Bo and Mimo. So both of those have actually been cut in the last 12 months, Bo only this year. Um, because we recognised that they weren't actually doing what we wanted them to do, they weren't receiving great customer feedback, um, and they've been knocked on the head. Um, and I think that's one of the things you need to recognise um, as a bank, and I think it's been recognised from, from the exec down. Um, what actually happened with Bo last year, um, we did some big investments in a company called Loot. Um, we invested, I think, about £10 million overall in Loot, which was a student finance company, a student company that helped with the sort of 
um, getting the the data in front of you on what you're spending money on. Um, Root then actually went bust. We'd already invested sort of 10 million pounds into it. And that investment was all through Bo. Um, I think what we recognized then was the reaction was from the board, these things will happen. If we invest in new technologies and we invest in new um, products um, with, with FinTech, occasionally this will happen. And we'll carry on doing this and some of them will be successful. The worst thing we could have done was have gone, oh my God, we're never doing any more investments of this site again and close the doors. And that would have been a disaster for us. But luckily the um, execs had the right, right answer and said, these things will happen and we'll, we'll, we'll continue. And it'll probably happen again in the future. And with Bo in the end, they actually made the decision that it wasn't gonna work for us either. So that was closed down in early this year and, and the, the team split up and went into the different teams on the projects that were, were carrying on like Metal and Till, which had been really successful. So I'm just going to jump on to another, just an example on Esme. Esme Loans, um, it's one of the success stories for us. So Esme Loans was actually launched um, a couple of years ago now as a brand new uh, standalone brand. So if you'd have initially gone into Esme Loans online, you'd have not seen any reference to NatWest Group or RBS Group at all. It's launched as a brand new standalone online loan provider. And basically you could apply and get lending decisions very quickly within 10 minutes and get um, business loans in, in your account within an hour. Um, and that was up to £250,000. Um, anyone who's dealt with a bank, whether it's us or anyone else, will realise usually um, for a main, mainstream bank, you cannot get a decision on a loan of that size in 10 minutes. And certainly you can't get the loan funds in your account within an hour. And the only way we were able to do that was to basically create a new fintech that sat within the bank, not using any of our old platforms or anything else like that. What that also allowed us to do was launch it with no NatWest or RBS branding on it um, and test it in the marketplace, which is what we tell our entrepreneurs to do, test it, get feedback, reiterate and, and test it again. Um, and that was in the end really successful. And it meant that we could actually now integrate it and we can now offer it as a product, as an alternative product for our relationship managers as well. Um, so jump on to the next slide, I'm short on time. Um, Cora is another one of our innovation projects and Cora is actually a human AI interface. Um, she actually has a human face. So some of our branches, um, when they were um, up and running, you could go in and talk to Cora. Um, it's actually a joint project with a company called Soul Machines, and they're the guys that did the uh, 3D graphics and uh, motion capturing for King Kong um, and Avatar, um, New Zealand-based company. So Cora not only could um, sort of answer your questions and understand what you're saying to them, but also could, with cameras looking back at you, read your emotions. So if you were looking particularly confused or happy or even angry, um, they could deal with that and potentially bring over an actual human to help you with that as well. Um, so that's one of the really sort of cutting edge projects we've done. And if you go, jump on the next point as well, which is Quora, um, we've also now linked in with things like um, Amazon and Google. Um, so you can actually get your um, balance up on your, on your mobile speaker device. Um, so integration with some of those big GAFA, um, companies so google amazon uh, etc um, to integrate and get some of our technology linked in with theirs and we feel, feel that's really important um, the bank's also linked in with facebook we use workplace for a lot of our communication now at the bank so linking in with those big technology firms is now part of the bank strategy as well so conscious of time very much a whistle stop tour through um, innovation at that west but happy to answer a couple of questions if we have time thank you thanks steve that was that was really really great um, yeah, really interesting to see kind of where which areas you should be focusing on from from an innovation standpoint and, and kind of NatWest's approach to innovation in general. Um, one question we've had come in is um, with kind of the the innovations that NatWest are are doing. Um, take Esme Loans for, for as an example. Um, you know, it's a standalone solution. It's on its own platform, um, completely um, disconnected from you know, your legacy systems, which often, you know, is part of a problem, right, in, in innovating fast. How do you then take yeah. some of the, the learnings and insights from that new innovation and bring it back into the, the core banking offering? I think that's one of the main things is that it allows us to do that. As you said, the, the legacy banking systems have been built up over dozens of years um, for all the banks that are, are horrendous to some extent to try and evolve because it involves technically unplugging something and plugging something new in and there's so many customers. We can't have our cash machines going down for two days. Um, so it's very difficult to have that sort of technology. So things like Esme allow us to test these things um, and implement them. So 
Um, the actual one of the companies we use to help us make that really quick decision is called Easy Bob, which is an Israeli company we found through that scouting, um, and they help us do that. So we can test within these small pockets, and we did the same with um, the video onboarding through Metal. That was done through Metal first, um, and once we found someone that can deal with perhaps the lower volumes it would see to a new new startup like Disney or Metal. We can then say actually this works smoothly, we're happy with it, and implement it across our sort of main customer brands. Uh, so it allows us the opportunity to, I guess, test products in a in a smaller pocket. Um, and what that also means sometimes is uh, we'll test things with things like Coots, which is our private banking brand. Obviously, um, it's a very very wealthy client, but also a much smaller group of clients. Um, so you often see some of this sort of uh, private banking initiatives. So uh, we had a biometric card, for example, um, that allowed you to sort of biometrics on your thumb on a car was actually tested so with the Coots group first of all because it's a much smaller group of customers if you have to test things off. Very cool and, and one one final question I think we can squeeze in um, and it's about kind of it, it, I guess kind of Nat Western and what you do internationally so you mentioned kind of Israeli um, kind of uh, you know scouting but but do you do anything on the African content continent and I know we've got a a kind of an audience from across the world actually in lots of different continents so kind of yeah Africa is a focus but also different continents around the world as well. Yeah so the the scouting team so there's the San Francisco team very much focused on Silicon Valley and they are dealing with the big the big tech companies over there. The rest of the world is very much more focused on startup businesses so it's actually Israel and the rest of the world it's actually a big patch and that does look at Africa but also across Singapore and Hong Kong and even Australia. Um, we've had some um, African participants in the Accelerator program, had um, Flutterway from Nigeria, who have actually been really successful, partnering with, with Visa and stuff. Um, so welcoming businesses from all over the world. In terms of scouting, we're always open to looking at the innovations from any country. Um, but I think the, the, there's, there's a limit of how many people we can sort of send out there. So I think we focused on the hotspots. Um, and, and Tel Aviv was, was one of those places. Uh, I think Melbourne, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong were sort of those hotspots of innovation. Um, but yeah, happy to look across, across, across the world. And certainly for accelerated participants, we've, we've got them from all, from all over the world and welcome them. If they're looking to set up in the UK, um, all means reach out to me or Pam afterwards and we can talk about how we can support you with that. Wonderful. Thanks, Steve. Really, really. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you. Just to um, just as, um, wrap up and say a massive thank you. Um, and we're really on time. So I um, just want to say, I ho um, hope you've enjoyed today's event. What we wanted to do is um, during this event, um, give you a flavor for why innovation and disruption is really important. And Roe, thank you. You celebrated that in a wonderful way, left lots of questions. I want to find those handbags for a start. Um, we've, we've heard from our entrepreneurs and, you know, the innovative entrepreneurs that we have on the program and how they, innovation can be in different ways, everything from drawing and scribble to data to fintech. So you've heard from that. And you've also heard how the bank does it. So our amazing Steve Chan in terms of how we look for innovation, how and why we do innovation and how it helps us and the, and, and, and the value it adds to our customers. So I hope you've enjoyed that. On that note, I'm going to hand over to you, Yanis. Thank you.